Good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's uh, yet another episode of uh, the uh, Godfather series. Today, we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Uh, John uh, Robinson. He's going to tell you his tale of joy and maybe a little bit of his tale of woe. But before uh, um, we start, for those of you that have been say that you read and heard everything I've done, I know you're, you're full of shit and you haven't. But I want to make sure that from now on to the they put dirt on me or until I stop doing these, whichever is first, I'm going to make sure I say this. Communication in the last month between mortals and non-mortals was changed forevermore. And that's when Elon the Musk said, go fuck yourself. Now, I have known that high-performance people talk that way all my, virtually all my life. But uh, it has become, uh, there was a period where it became less and less popular, and it, it may still be that, um, but uh, for my next seminar, uh, which starts tonight, uh, I've compiled some uh, data about studies, um, and I, I, I probably saw the first study 15, 20 years ago from Harvard, that high-performance people tend to swear more than uh, low-performance people. But um, most of you that haven't done deals, that's the reason. I'm also bringing out of the archives for the, oh God, it must be five, six years ago, uh, a little uh, ditty on uh, alpha males. And I've told you that, uh, you know, 98% uh, of the high performance people in the world aren't alpha males. But maybe what you didn't hear the next sentence is, but they have alpha male characteristics. And most of you that have not had done a deal or have taken forever to do a deal, that's the reason. Because, and it's, uh, it's a cute little series, it's about 25 or 30 minutes long, um, and it uh, shows how uh, chimpanzees puff their, themselves up and uh, silverback gorillas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but having said that now, go fuck yourself, and I, I reintroduce uh, Dr. John. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for being here. Okay. Uh, what, we, what we accomplish in this series is uh, people that have uh, been successful, uh, from success to super success, uh, talk a little bit about uh, what they found hardest, uh, what they found easiest, if anything. Some people have been here and said we didn't find anything easy to have. You know, uh, every time you open a door, there's another door and it's darker. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what they say. Um, but uh, the model, does the model work? Uh, and um, if you had to do it over again from the beginning, and we were just talking about when he was here, he came to both the regular seminar and the hardcore in 2018. Um, we are now in December 2023, uh, so five years from the last hardcore he attended. Full disclosure, I'm his chairman. Uh, from time to time, I've been reluctantly his chairman, but I'm his chairman. Uh, and uh, he, he's done better than most, but not as good as he could. So, John, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, of course, for having me. Quick introduction, my name is Dr. John A. Robinson, and I build wellness companies. Specifically, I'm the founder of Relicus Medical, which focuses on anti-aging medicine, longevity, and it's a particular QLA roll-up, just like Dan teaches, and it's an acquisitions company, of course, and it's a management company. And we've had uh, some modicum of success. Yes, it took me uh, a little while to get that first deal. Uh, hey, let me interrupt you. Part of the, and I take blame for this, and I don't take blame for much, but I had him search a uh, mega acquisition in the beginning, which I had looked at 15 years prior, um, and it took, we got right down to the uh, goal line, and uh, somebody bought it by writing a check for $6 million. It, it was, yes, it, it, all, all in. All, but they, in. all in. And that was, uh, I got that email uh, on Jan in January of 2020, right before COVID, I got that email. And yes, that was uh, uh, one of the largest wellness companies, uh, anti-aging companies uh, out there. And uh, 
you said, why don't you buy it? And that, in our talk, and without hesitation, I said, okay. And I had no expectation of that. I didn't walk into the seminar thinking that particularly. Uh, and that's exactly what I did, went for it. And it took a while, but learned quite a bit along the way. And, you know, I, I failed. I failed. We failed. We failed. Yeah, it's, uh, it wasn't easy, the whole process. And there were certainly things that could have been done differently. But ultimately, I think, you know, when you'd said before, what's the, the thing that was the hardest? And I underestimated how difficult the banks were going to be that process of understanding how difficult that was going to be. Not to say that it was hard or impossible, but I underestimated how difficult that was. And so when it came to that particular deal that we're talking about, when I look now in hindsight for how much that was, uh, I should have been able to uh, close that deal rapidly. But it was about establishing myself, my own patterns, uh, who I was, as the founder of this particular company early on without actually having anything at that point, not leveraging the board correctly, many things that were done incorrectly that ultimately they just didn't buy the story. And in hindsight, they should be buying the story, but uh, here we are. So subsequent to that, uh, you went on to what would be considered more, more normal yeah. purely roll-ups and right. you've had success. Yeah. The typical one to five million dollar range, let's say US, is I would say probably more typical uh, of a range for QLA in terms of a beginning phase and a roll up process uh, where what we were looking at before was a 50 million dollar company. So the first deal was 2.7 million in revenue. We did that for uh, 2.4 million. And I closed that deal on December 31st, 2021 at 6 p.m. when everyone was getting ready to go out and uh, have parties. I was, all, the, the hours leading in to all of that was incredibly intense and focused. And I stayed on point. And I would have done anything at that point to make sure that deal was closed at that time. So much so that the- Including paying a notary. The, a, a, a lot of money to have that notary come personally to the house. Uh, I, it wouldn't have mattered what they would have said to me. I think it was 800 bucks or something like that to have her personally come and do it, but they could have said 8,000 and I wouldn't have flinched at that point. And we, we closed it. And then from there, there's been a lot of things that have continually growing. So as I said before, I, I, I grow wellness companies. So we took that well-established company as we're taught in QLA something that's not necessarily in distress per se, but has viability, and it did. We just went in through professional management, through focused increasing of the service offering. So they had a certain number of services that they were offering. We went in and just added to that, professionalized everything, improved the marketing, even though the marketing was already very good, and we've had 30% increase with that particular location. And then within a year, we closed on another one that was larger in revenue, uh, 3.1 in revenue, but we got that for 2.1. So I was able to negotiate that based on the circumstances of the world and the situation and actually got a better deal on that one. Same type of wellness company uh, as, as compared to the first one. And part and parcel of getting a better deal the second time is... Uh... Well, if you don't get a better deal, the second deal you do, it's because your brain did, okay? And the model, uh, the QLA model, uh, uh, lends itself to being able to improve the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth time. And uh, when you've got 25 or 30 deals under your belt, uh, I'm not saying they're giving them to you, but they're almost giving them to you because you've learned so many different things through the uh, previous 15 or 20. Uh, and so that, uh, those deals, uh, and, the, and he's managing those. The management team is managing them from afar. They're uh, two-thirds away across the country towards the East Coast, uh, and he's uh, based in uh, uh, Arizona, uh, his own practice, uh, and where he lives. Uh, and then he went on after that to... To, yeah, to grow all of this, yes. 
yeah, I start off by saying I do have my own private practice in Scottsdale, Arizona. And what I decided to do really separate from the practice was to do this particular acquisition company, you know, a la QLA. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a fantastic process. You know, when you were saying about the improvement along the way, definitely the second deal was better. I was more confident in how I was approaching everything with the seller. The seller actually came to me. I knew my negotiation skills were improving. I just knew what position I had moving into that second deal. And then subsequently on our third deal, it was the same thing, that, that improved. The level of carry back grew dramatically in comparison to the first. That actually helped quite a bit for our third deal to actually get to finally a conventional loan process. And I think I'll, I'll look forward to explaining more about the process of going from SBA and starting with SBA and being very thankful that SBA gives you a bridge to get it all started. But in the end, SBA is not going to take you where you need to go. You've got to get yourself into a conventional banking situation and relationship. And we were able to achieve that. And once we did, particularly with the third acquisition, that's when the doors really started to open. They understood what we were doing. We had already built the two. Uh, we had grown the first two. We had had strength and EBITDA and revenue. We proved ourselves out. And at that point, they just started largely opening up the door. That's what made a massive difference at that point. So kind of full circle from understanding how difficult it is with the banking relationship process of developing that. But all the steps that I had done, all the failures even up to that point, had led in ultimately to that moment. Of, of improving and, and getting that relationship. It was really key. And the third acquisition was back towards the West Coast of the United yeah, States. Yeah, then I went to California. California, which isn't that far away from uh, his base in Scottsdale. Right. Uh, and the, um, but every deal, every deal is different. Uh, prior to the third deal, after the second deal, he had another deal, which was on the eastern part of the United States. Oh, yes. Yeah. and. Uh, and I suggested that, uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, that he shouldn't do it, uh, and that and he didn't. And the um, and he's, he's looked at a bunch of other deals. Many, oh, countless uh, at this point. Yeah. Well, to speak to that particular deal without going into too much detail, it was uh, in Florida. It was a $10 million company, where most of the companies we've been dealing with now are right around between one and three. So $10 million company and very strong EBITDA by what we could tell. And that, from my perception, was that it would have launched the company forward. The issue was that it was just prior to the third deal before establishing that conventional loan relationship. And I was looking into, I would say now in hindsight, unwisely into investment bankers. As I say now, investment bankers are just business brokers uh, with a nicer suit. Uh, they're all generally uh, disingenuous, to say the least. And they weren't able to accomplish, well, they could have accomplished it, but they would have accomplished the deal at a, well, the sacrifice, really, of control of a lot of the things that we had built up to that point, and that wasn't going to fly. Between what I was assessing, but certainly uh, from your, uh, your wisdom. And, and, and as uh, Charlie Munger, God rest his soul, said that uh, he didn't hate investment bankers quite as much as he hated crypto, uh, but very close to his level of hatred for crypto. And he basically says that they're crooks. And, the, uh, and they always, not always, but almost always have a second agenda, uh, which is strong within the first agenda to represent you. Yes. And that's for them to do all okay. Yep. And so, uh, 